here with Kenix, um, talking about what we do, some of our history. You know, we have an academy where we work with young people, teach recording and production, and we're looking to bring that here as well as our actual production facilities. I'm a music engineer and producer. So an engineer would be the person that does the recording and mixing. I'm known for that. I've actually won Grammys for that. And I'm also a music producer and, and a bit of a songwriter. You would probably most know me for Miseducation of Lauryn Hill, uh, Amy Winehouse's first album, Frank, Su Carlos, Super Carlos Santana's album, Supernatural, and Will Smith's Men in Black. I've been here about three times and each time that I've come, I've really been impressed by the talent, the, the connections that I made here, the people, and I'm really looking forward to interacting with African artists and African music. Um, at the time when I first started coming, which was in two, my first trip was in 2001. Um, Afro, it wasn't the, pres the Afrobeat presence wasn't like it is now. And I, and I was looking then at the talent that was, I think the Kwaito was actually just really coming around. You know, it was more like still an underground thing at that time. And I was already impressed with the music and the sounds and I really wanted to uh, get involved. I think the Nigerian hustle is amazing, you know, in terms of bringing forward the, the new sounds. And the, the way that they interact and collaborate with each other, it reminds me a lot of early hip hop. You know, what, what happened actually growing up in the Bronx when seeing the, the, the beginnings of hip hop, you know, that's what it was. It was actually neighborhood music and neighborhood crews that were together that in, in, in unifying actually helped that music to spread and become the worldwide phenomenon that it is. And I, and I feel like uh, Africa's doing the same, particularly out of Nigeria. If you look at hip hop, and again, I, I relate things to hip hop because that was my upbringing in music, but it's also the upbringing of pretty much the industry in, in general now, um, in the modern industry. Um, I think that the same way that blues and soul were the foundations of, of rock and rap, it's the same way that the traditional African sounds are the foundation of the Afro, what we call Afro beat or Afro pop. So we can't throw away the past in, and, don't, and forget that because they're where the jewels are. Even if you look at um, hip, hip life, you know, that was high life. It came from the high life music, which influenced the hip life now, which is basically rapping over the high life. So in the same way, if that music wasn't there and, and there wasn't a tradition that was kind of carried on, we wouldn't have had the hip life, which is like the progenitor to the Afro beat and, the, and the, the rhyming on top of these new rhythms now. So I think that that's the, 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 all the jewels are there in the traditional music. We are facing the same challenges that we faced early in hip hop, you know, there was, there was not a lot of industry, there wasn't any industry, there wasn't even, we didn't even have a, a music that was looked on as music. You know, I remember hearing then that hip hop would be a fad, you know, it would be around for a year or two. Here it is 40 years later and it's the, the number one music in the world. So I think the challenge is, anytime that you're at the forefront of any movement, there are going to be challenges because you're first. But that just requires the perseverance and keep knocking at the door. And obviously something's working because you know, Davido's on the radio in New York. You know, WizKid is on the radio in the daytime in America, which is a big deal. The thing about the entertainment industry, like most industries, you see the, the, the flash of the forefront, but behind an artist, there are many jobs. Just like right now, we're doing an interview. There's a cameraman, there's people who write scripts, there's people who edit, there's people who, you know, set up lights. These, these opportunities are there as well in the industry for African music, African music business, but they may not be um, known up front because we just see the flash of the artist. So I think there's many opportunities to, uh, if we uh, uh, chase them. This trip is going to be unfortunately too short, so I don't really know about collaborations right now because mostly we're here doing panels and speaking and trying to give of ourselves and, and our um, background. But I'm looking at collaborations all across the board. You know, I've, I've, my career in music has spanned many genres. So in the same way I see African music having many genres, it's not just Afrobeat, that's just the thing that's popular now. But, you know, I'm a fan going all the way back to Fela Kuti and Mano Dibango. So the music, uh, there's so many different sounds, so many different rhythms. I think that um, I, for me, I would be looking to collaborate wherever there's true heart and true um, authenticity. Believe in yourself, you know, trust that you're on a path that was set for you, if music is really your path, 
and persevere because all of us, we had to do it. Me, me being here right now is a testament of that because as I said in another panel earlier, we didn't start off with friends in high places. You know, we had to keep knocking at the door, keep knocking at the door. I remember the first time going to a record company when I first, and I was probably about 17 at the time, and I sat outside of a, literally in the lobby of MCA Records at the time for eight hours. Like, watch people go in and out just to get somebody to say, hey, come back tomorrow, you know, but that come back tomorrow turned into coming back tomorrow and eventually a meeting. So you gotta persevere. It's a huge privilege to be here as a Pan-African. I grew up in West Africa and I live in Accra. And being a curator and a creative director and a business associate, we're here to illustrate intra-Africa trade in action. And we're really passionate about doing this through fine arts. We see that um, fine arts in particular across the art sector is a burgeoning um, sector, particularly in Africa. You have a lot of um, artists doing great uh, work in, in London with the likes of Sotheby's and Bonhams picking up these artists. And we felt that it's really important to have a, an experience of this in, under one roof here at Canex. And I think that we often take for granted that as Africans we see art all around us all the time. But what I find really reassuring and, 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 and exciting is that people who've come through this particular exhibition, I think through the curatorial, um, we've been quite deliberate in bringing both South African and Ghanaian artists together, um, really, they've really loved seeing that. Um, they've really loved to see the juxtaposition. Some people are looking at the materiality, which, which you know, the detail in, in the way a Ghanaian artist will, will do their work in a South African. So the response is astounding and I think that um, is what this whole uh, conference is about. I think on the ground um, where the rubber hits the road you really at this point are not seeing the value in terms of for the fine arts. You'd like to see that the, the sector is, is taken more seriously as business, as um, a sector that is contributing to GDPs as a sector that will turn around the economic um, jobs de deficit, particularly among youth. So the target audience that you will see, all of these artists here potentially under 30. And that is where a lot of unemployment is happening, not only in South Africa, but across the continent. So I think governments really need to take fine arts in particular seriously over and above all the other arts, because that's where a lot of share of value can be derived. And the number of art fairs we've seen over the, in the last 10 years has, in, has increased. We had Artex Lagos to Cape Town Art Fair and everything in between. You know, Rwanda's also looking at art. So the demand has increased. We can track that by the number of art fairs we're seeing. Over and above that, you have individual collectors and the age group of collectors increasing. We have indicators for that as well. So I think Africans are really taking the responsibility and taking seriously, individual Africans, the responsibility of I think not collecting from a place of, yes, it's cool and chic to do that now, but I personally as a curator are seeing um, both business um, people and young people, young professionals, realizing that if we don't take, um, take seriously the sector and, and really have these pieces remain here on the continent, then we'll continue this conversation that we're seeing with the Benin bronzes of you know, bringing back our works. So it's not so much to be antagonistic to other markets or antagonistic to other communities, but it's to say that when we collect, we're saying we value. And so valuing ourselves begins with valuing the artworks that come from this continent. Gaining access is a huge challenge. Um, simple, sim put simply, an artist will finish their work from um, identifying a customer. Um, if they're not able to get to an art fair, if they're not with a gallery, even in their local environment, if they're not selected, they don't get the access. So their work certainly does not get the exposure that it deserves and often they're very, very good artists who may just need nurturing. So I think it's, it's, it's the end-to-end -end piece, it's the value chain, it's developing that value chain. And so um, the, the more exposure they have locally, the potential to get exposure globally increases, not only from a media perspective, from collector base, from, you know, um, you know, in terms of just the buying power of different audiences. So that is a huge, you know, it's a huge value chain and, and that access is what we want to see more of. We have um, a few genres, as we call it, um, here at the, at the center. We have the South African artist, for instance, one of my favorites is Lizo Pemba, and his grandfather was what we call a master. So the Pemba 
um, the Pembers that you'll see being sold at as high as 300,000 Rand. We have his grandson and Lizo has done a piece at the back and it's a real beautiful township piece. Um, I just had a, collect, um, a, 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 a visitor here talk and stand and stare at the piece quite deeply. And so that Lizo's piece is very colorful and it shows a kind of you know, typical township uh, landscape. But that's a very full um, piece that you'll see. Juxtaposed to the Ghanaian works that you'll see one of, of these behind me, um, a, a, a curator, a friend of mine commented that what's different about the Ghanaian artists who will do a lot of what we call figurative art, so um, impressions of individuals, and we're seeing a lot of that uh, very popular in, in big shows like 154, is the figurative pieces also are quite comfortable with leaving the background, um, their open space. So, so those kinds of pieces is a lot of figurative artwork, which is very popular in West Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, Senegal, but you also have um, you know, South African futurist uh, works by Pumzile, um, looking at sort of the juxtaposition of technology and, um, and, you know, fine, and, and paint works by her. So it's a beautiful range. It also shows the depth and breadth of artists across Africa, the different modalities and mediums and materiality. So photography as well, um, where we're seeing the use of multimedia. There's an artist there who's also using fabrics that have been cut up and repurposed to make beautiful artworks. So it really shows the ingenuity, the dexterity, but also the skill base of our artists on the continent. My name is Anna Yao Ferreta. I'm a Ghanaian. I'm a writer. I'm an artist. Well, now we call ourselves in the creatives business. I started um, as a journalist. I worked as a lecturer. I've worked for the World Bank Group as a strategic communications advisor and um, started publishing books on art, history and the culture of Ghana. I turned 50 last year, which was around the same time as COVID. I've always been interested in decorating my own home with sort of symbols of tradition and culture, pattern sounds. So I started decorating pots. So my company is Heritage Project. And as part of Heritage Project, um, documentaries, publishing, coffee, coffee table books or what I call cocoa table books but more recently we've also started hand painting traditional symbols and patterns onto clay. There's always been traditional artwork in Ghana. One of the books that I published, Ghana's Heritage of Culture, traces you know particular patterns and symbols back to the 14th century. There's always been. In fact our, our patterns and our symbols are if you like our hieroglyphics because they all mean something. Every color, every symbol, every movement actually means something. So there's a full non-verbal communication that's always going on around us. So I've always been interested in it. I come from a royal family and even the sound of drums and the pattern of the drums means something. So that's always been part of my life. But I have to say that there is nothing like being under COVID lockdown to get you to say, well, what else can I do? I'm stuck at home. Home, and I looked around me at home and I had kente and I had a dinkra and I thought how else to do it so I started putting them on pots and then on masks so I also made masks with um, traditional and customary symbols on it so we have heritage pots which is new heritage masks which came out from under COVID but we've always had heritage project which does the cultural books strategic communications and documentaries I think first of all just myself learning about Ghanaian culture. I'm an Akan and of course we have a Dinkra symbols and everybody's supposed to know that. And I learned throughout my research that other ethnic groups also have their own symbols. So that was a good thing for me to know. Number two, that as much as we're different, some things stay the same. That some patterns and symbols in Côte d'Ivoire, in Togo, have resonance in Ghana and in Angola and in Cameroon. So it's been very exciting for me to, first of all, to get 
get my own understanding of the Akan culture. Secondly, how it plays within Ghana and then Ghana within the diaspora. There's a particular fabric, for instance, which we've done a hand-painted um, clay pot. It's called in Ghana the Angelina. And Angelina is actually the name of a song, a um, very popular song back in the 50s and 60s of a high life band. In other countries, the same fabric is known as dashiki. In southern Africa, it's also known. So there is a conversation that has taken place starting from the 14th century into now. And I think that the digital space is helping to bring it all a little closer together. I mean, for instance, being here, um, speaking with you, this conversation is going out to several hundreds, thousands, hopefully millions of people. So the art conversation has always been there. Now, I am excited to be part of the translation of it. Hi, my name is Toby Gilliam Kieser. I am the CEO and founder of Maboto. We are in the business of manufacturing and creating leather goods using waste material and we are based here in Durban, South Africa. We manufacture all our products here locally. Currently our anchor products are the ladies' handbags. So what we do is that we uh, source all our materials from our local tanneries, uh, selecting waste material uh, and then we produce the bags and then when we sell it uh, online uh, to our target market. Uh, so we do, lo we do work with our local tenorers, more especially because that's where we source our leather skins from and also as well as people in our, our local communities, uh, especially whenever we have, uh, you know, in African culture, whenever we have cultural celebrations, you know, there's always skins that, um, that become as remains and too often what we do is that we go out to our communities and teach them about the recycling of skins and also then bringing in the tenories so that they, uh, they get to be educated about the, the recycling parts. The business was registered in 2013, but we started operating in 2017 when I finally resigned from my corporate job because I was ready. Um, because for so long, I mean, I have been, with the business knowledge that I have today, um, when I started off, I didn't have any business knowledge, no formal business training, no experience whatsoever. So as I was working, working in the corporate world, I was learning from my CEOs and, and, and just uh, learning from all the skills of how to run a business. And then I decided to apply all those learnings uh, into my business. So I think it was a time of being ready uh, as well as the, the right time for me to start a business that I'm passionate about and that focuses on creating beautiful products for women. I just resigned, so I had funds um, for my savings uh, and also you know the package that you get after you leaving your work so I saved I took all my savings and what I decided to do because I knew that creating a local brand it wasn't going to be as easy because we have so many imports and so many brands from outside of Africa so I thought to myself let me start creating a profile for for the brand so that it, it's known so I started from educating uh, the local um, customers about Maboto and what it does and giving them a brief background about what we do and how we trade because there's also that um, issue with our local consumers and also uh, people from South Africa not knowing about what the local businesses really do and what happens behind that. So that's what I started doing and then what I, wa what I also did was to because uh, of the fact that there were a lot of trade shows that were taking place in South Africa, especially in Durban. So I would go to uh, and attend and exhibit in trade shows like this. One of them was the Essence Festival, which I would engage and have lots of visitors from international visitors. So with international visitors coming through to, to you know to, to see our to our products, then that's when I decided to take my products across to, this, to, to, to America. And that's when I um, then decided to actually go and exhibit in other international trade shows. So those are the few steps that I took, uh, big risks, um, educating the locals about the, the business, the brand, as well as now um, the exporting parts and taking it across to uh, countries like in America. The brand is inspired by our my Zulu culture uh, because there's a lot of inspiration that comes with culture and so often we don't use that. And when I initially started, I actually wanted to tell an African story. What inspired initially was my grandfather's cows, because when he, when he passed on, I actually inherited eight of his cows. And one of them had a brown and white pattern. 
So as I was sitting at, uh, at the farmhouse, just gazing around and looking, I thought to myself, what are the best ways of honoring the legacy of my father, as well as my, my, late, my late father, and as well as my late grandfather? Uh, and how can I produce a brand that is uniquely African and that also would inspire women? And also for women to carry something that is so valuable and that is so unique, because all our products are actually um, unique. So each person, we actually make this specifically for that type of woman. So a, uh, a customer will choose and select from our various patterns and, uh, and then we will we'll actually design according to your, to your, to your design. So, um, so that's the speciality and the niche market that we're focusing uh, on. We see our business uh, growing as broad as in Africa. So right now what we're doing is that uh, we are partnering with other and collaborating with Af other manufacturers in Africa, like in Kenya, where we source some of our, for, from our leather and also uh, buying skins from various other parts, like in the southern parts of Africa. And um, so we try to, you know, um, uh, collaborate with, with other um, people, with other businesses in, in, Af in other African countries, as well as obviously working with local tanneries and so forth. So we definitely want to work, to have a better relationship and integration with, with other African countries and their manufacturers in ensuring that we produce an, um, an African uh, or made in Africa product so that we either sell it amongst the African continent and as well as focusing on exporting our products in the US. With a lot of challenges that Africa faces and the lack of infrastructure, the lack of resources, the lack of capital, um, I think it's important right now for Africans to unite to make sure that we we, we create our own resources because it's, it's, that is a challenge. So by collaborating and working together, that's the only way of telling our story that could be uh, told to the rest of the world. So, and that's what we have. We have so, so much inspiration, so much creativity, uh, so much passion, so much talent. But if we're not there to tell our stories, then who will be the one who's going to be telling that for us? My name is Gennet, Gennet Kabeda from Ethiopia, born and raised in Ethiopia and uh, I work with Ethiopian handwoven fabrics in modern design and I have been doing this uh, for the last uh, 29 years since 1992. Paradise Fashion, uh, since the beginning, which is way back uh, in 1992, we start with a vision to promote the Ethiopian hand weaving textile and product. So I work a lot with only, I can say, not any other than Ethiopian hand weaving fabric, which is made by hand with the traditional wooden looms. Uh, there is nothing in, in technology integrated. It is uh, all my products are made of using the Ethiopian local cotton, different kind of counts of cotton from hand span to machine span, 20, ca uh, 20 um, count, 40, 60, and we use blending all those kind of uh, cotton. We do our hand weaving, then from the hand weaving we produce ladies wear, and also we have accessories like shawls and uh, uh, different kind of uh, scarves. Uh, but mainly we use the Ethiopian hand woven fabric and we have a cooperative, a women cooperative that they work with us to do the, our hand weaving. In Ethiopia, we have really quite a very huge number of weavers in the country, whether it is outside of Addis or based in Addis. I'm based in, in the capital Addis, and there are a lot of weavers. So it is a resource and it's a beautiful tradition that we have a very unique and very beautiful fabric that is made of hand weaving. So first it is like you do a sustainable a different kind of fabric instead of using machine span because we add value to it you know using Ethiopian hand woven fabric it is something you promote your tradition your heritage your culture at the same time you do a modern design where the Western world can really see also the beautiful texture and fabric that we have so mainly that's why I work a lot and I work a lot with women because I believe in women empowerment and also giving a better lifestyle to a woman. So as a woman and as a mother, I love working with women and all these years I have worked with women also. In the last, especially few years, so the seven to 10 years, what we're doing is taking, taking women that they don't have an opportunity for work, we train them to do weaving 
then we give that opportunity. And we have seen a big impact in saving and giving an opportunity to their family. So I stick in doing that. So we have, even though we have a lot of weavers and some specific designs, men can do, but in general, I work with women. So that is the main reason because women can do it. I mean, it's not any uh, things that's so complicated apart from some of the jacquard design, which it takes more time and more uh, sophisticated that they does the main, but the, all the women that they're working with us, they do all kinds of, all the, pro the collection you see here that I have been doing in the past that I export is woven by women.